Hi, so welcome to the next session as we continue with our IFRS Masterclass. And we want to begin with one of the interesting accounting standards, and that is IAS 38, Intangible Assets. So let me bring up my screen and let's go. So what are intangible assets? We want to take some quick definitions and we'll build the knowledge up gradually in discussing the principles relating to IAS 38, intangible assets. An intangible asset is an identifiable non-monetary asset without physical substance. Without physical substance. What does that mean? Example of that is license, patent, trademark, goodwill, copyright. All these are intangible assets. But when we say something is identifiable, what do we mean? Something can be defined as identifiable if it can be sold separately, if it can be transferred, if it can be exchanged, if it can be licensed, if it can be rented out, then we say that it is what? Identifiable. But the question we need to ask ourselves is, what is the recognition criteria for intangible assets? It's the same thing as we did in IAS 16. So, we recognize intangible assets if it is probable that future economic benefits attributable to the asset will flow to the entity and that the cost of the asset can be measured reliably. That was the same thing we mentioned under IAS 16, property, plants, and equipment. So after the recognition criteria, how do we measure intangible assets? In other words, what is the initial measurement of intangible assets? The same thing we spoke about in IAS 16 will apply here. So at recognition, the intangible assets should be recognized at cost, which is the purchase price plus directly attributable cost. So if we were acquiring a franchise, so let's say we want to open an outlet of whatever, KFC. So we go and uh, buy the franchise. So we, we pay for the franchise, the franchise fee. Let, let's assume that that is like 20 million. Then before we arrange the deal, we need to engage some lawyers. So we paid some legal fees. And let's say that is about a million. Is then probably some other directly attributable cost that we incurred in arranging this deal. Maybe we need to get some legal clearance, some government approval and all that in relation to the franchise. And that is like 1.5 million. So the initial cost at which the franchise that we purchased from KFC will be recognized will be 22.5 million. That is what we mean by the initial measurement of intangible assets. So here, the journal entry is going to be pretty simple. So we bring up the journal entry and the journal entry is to, will be to debit intangible assets. Okay, that's a franchise that we bought with the 22.5 million and then credit cash if we have made all these payments or maybe payables if it is outstanding to 2.5 million. That is the initial measurement, the initial recognition of intangible assets. Next one. After that initial recognition, just like we discussed in IAS 16, the entity can choose between the cost model and the revaluation model. And we've spoken about this already in IAS 16, so I'm not going to talk about it here again, but they have the options to look at it. And as we mentioned under IAS 16, the revaluation model can only be used if there is an active market and we can determine reliably the fair value of the intangible asset. If not, then the entity would have to apply the cost model. Next one, an intangible asset other than goodwill, recognized in the acquiree's financial statement acquired as part of the business, should initially be recognized at fair value. I'm going to explain this to you in a moment, so stay with me carefully. Internally generated goodwill should not be recognized. Now, IAS 38 paid attention to three issues that we need to look at. The first one is research. We'll get into this in a moment, don't worry. The second one is development. And the third one is goodwill. You see, goodwill has two things. 
goodwill can arise as a result of acquisition of another business or it can be internally generated by the entity. What we are saying here is that the standard prohibits the recognition of internally generated goodwill. What does that mean? Let me explain to you. Like internally generated goodwill is like we say that, oh, the insurer premium brand, okay, the insurer premium brand, because of the way it is, when we look at our applications, when we look at our portal, when we look at our YouTube channel, when we look at our Instagram, when we look at our TikTok, we look at our Facebook, we look at our online presence, oh, we are really impacting a lot of people, we are receiving a lot of messages from people. So because of that, uh, let's attribute the Insura Premium brand an amount of, say, 10 million pounds, then we put that on the face of our financial statement that's not realistic that is called internally generated goodwill the standard prohibits that kind of thing however if our company premium education hub goes and acquires another company maybe another educational institute maybe the icag we acquire the icag just an example okay and the net assets of ICA. It's say 20 million, but then the consideration, how much we paid in the deal is 25 million. Then the excess amount is called goodwill at acquisition, 5 million. That can be recognized in the consolidated financial statement when we are preparing the consolidated financial statement. So goodwill from acquisition can be recognized in the consolidated financial statements. And then in the individual books of the subsidiary that we acquired, but then internally generated goodwill cannot be recognized. Let's continue. Expenditure incurred in the research phase of an internally generated intangible asset should be expensed as incurred. I told you about research. So if a company is seeking to understand its product or researching about a product, and they incur some cost, this is what we are saying. So let's say, for instance, we employ 10 people and we gave them 10 iPads and we ask, we, we ask them to go to 20 universities across Africa and we are going to be paying them allowance of whatever, 1000 per person, PP, and they are going to have travel expenses in total of 10000 All they are doing is to gather information about the insurer premium brand because we want to find out how we can change and improve upon what we are doing as a as an institute so that is research that is research now the standard states that all research expenses that we incurred should be written off in the pnl account but there is a key thing that you must understand there so what does that mean it means that the allowances that we paid them, the travel expenses that we give them, these are research expenses, 110,000. They are recurrent expenditures. We'll recognize it as an expenses in the profit or loss account. That's what we are saying. However, the cost of the iPad cannot be written off. So any capital expenditure incurred at the research faced must be capitalized and amortized over the economic useful life of the asset. So capital expenditure incurred on research must be capitalized and amortized or depreciated over the economic useful life of the iPad. And that could be three years, it could be five years based on our own estimation. Next one. Expenditure incurred in the development phase of an internally generated intangible asset must be capitalized provided certain tightly defined criteria are met. So when we move from the research, they gather the information and bring to us, we will start develop using the research information to develop a product prototype or improve upon the existing product. That is development. And development costs can only be capitalized when the recognition criteria is met. So capitalization criteria. We call it sector. What does that mean? S means it should be a separately identifiable asset. Two, we can estimate the cost reliably. Three, 
there is a commercial value that means there's a market for what we are supposed to we are developing there's a ready market for it for it's technically feasible in other words it is something that can actually be done by the entity all means overall profitability what does that mean because there could be a ready market for what we are developing but we are a for-profit making organization and so if we don't make profit then what is the purpose of what we are developing as an organization then R means that there is resources available to complete and make it ready for the market so these are the things we need to understand now usually in a given question we are going to be looking at issues like commercial viability because not all of it will be stated in the question so sometimes the one that is very crucial that will be stated that will be obvious in a given question will be the issue about commercial viability and the issue about technical feasibility and then sometimes resource availability so you have to be on the lookout if this criteria is not there what is going to happen is that all development costs will be expensed in the PL account. So not all development expenditures will be capitalized. They will only be capitalized upon the meeting of the recognition criteria. So after that recognition, an intangible asset with finite useful life should be amortized over its economic useful life, commencing when the asset is available for use in the manner intended by management so what does that mean because that relates to the last but one statement says an intangible asset with an infinite life should not be amortized but should be reviewed for impairment on an annual basis so intangible assets can broadly be divided into two and the type of intangible asset tells us how we account for it so we have intangible assets with finite economic use for life meaning we know the economic is for life like example is what i mentioned earlier a license license have economic is for life when you take a license it has passed or to be for a period and you have to renew it so license will have a finite life the franchise that i told you about earlier would have a finite life development cost that we have capitalized will have a finite life so capitalized development cost would have a finite life for these kind of intangible assets what we say is that we amortize it we amortize the cost over the economic useful life but there are other intangible assets with infinite economic useful life in other words you cannot determine when they will be out So intangible asset with infinite economic is for life. Example of this could be goodwill. And sometimes in a way we can talk about issues like patent. Even though patent to some extent can be a finite thing, sometimes it can be indefinite. And so for these kind of intangible assets, we don't amortize because if you are amortizing over how many years? Okay, over how many years? So that's one, what we do is to test for impairments annually. And we'll look at the way we test for impairment in a moment. An asset is impaired when the carrying amount is greater than the recoverable amount. So we'll look at that later on under IAS 36. So we test for impairment for intangible assets with indefinite economic use for life. But the ones with definite economic use for life, we amortize. So it means that the amortization will be the cost divided by economic useful life. If it is less than a year, then X over 12 will come in. And journal entry is very simple. You debit your profit or loss because amortization is an expense. Then you credit the intangible asset as well. If we test for impairment and the asset has suffered an impairment, still we will debit profit or loss because impairment is an expenses then we credit the intangible asset in question. So that is how we account for intangible assets on subsequent measurement. It depends on whether it has a finite or an infinite economic useful life. Finally, residual value should be assumed to be nil, except in rare circumstances when an active market exists 
or there is a commitment by a third party to purchase the asset at the end of its useful life. Then, on disposal of an intangible asset, any gain or loss is recognized in the profit or loss account. That is very simple. So, if we are disposing of the intangible asset, suddenly we'll compare the carrying value at the date of the disposal to the cash that we got at the date of the disposal. The difference between that will either be a gain or a profit, and that will be recognized in the profit or loss account. These are the things that you must understand when we talk about IAS 38 intangible assets. And I'll see you in the next video as we take a question and see how some of these principles actually apply in practice.